begin our time of reading today. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. We're in part something. I don't know what part this is. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We're in part something. It's just in the words of uh, Minister DJ Khaled, it's another one. <laughs> another one. Faith University. <laughs> Mark 4, 35 says that that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. And there were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? (laughs) Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him. Who, who is this? I, I, want, I want to tag a title of this text. I want to talk from this subject in our time together, family. I'm trying to see something. I'm, 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 trying, I'm trying to see something. I'm trying to see something. Some time ago, I was hanging out with a friend of mine in the, one of my favorite parts of Orlando, the Windermere, Florida area. And so As we were hanging out, engaging in some conversation, he randomly asked me a question about a specific store in a specific place called The Grove. He says, Darius, have you heard of Jeremiah's? I said, I know about Jeremiah's. I mean, I see Jeremiah's all the time. I'm familiar with Jeremiah's. So, yeah, I know about Jeremiah's. He says... Well, have you experienced Jeremiah's? I said, well, no. I mean, I saw it. It looks kind of like a water ice place. And you know, bro, you know, I'm from Jersey, so we got readers. I I don't, once you got readers and once you get Philly water ice, you don't want any other water ice. He says, D, I'm just, when we get done here, just walk over with me to Jeremiah's. I says, okay, man, I'm going to go see what you're talking about. So we walk over to Jeremiah's, and I see the menu, and I see the plethora of options that are there. I see the complexity of the concoctions that they came up with. I'm talking about gelato, sorbet, water ice, all mixed in one. I started seeing the vast array of fruity flavors (laughs) that were available for those of us who wanted to passionately partake in this pleasurable, delicious, delectable delight called Jeremiah's. Something in my spirit told me mix it together, Darius. Don't settle for singular when God wants to give you double. I said, give me that cotton candy and mix it with the Kiwi Tropical. And because I followed my spirit and I mixed that cotton candy with that Kiwi Tropical After one bite, I looked at this brother and the scripture that was pinned by the psalmist came to my heart. Oh, taste and see (laughs) that the Lord is good. (laughs) Now, I don't want any other water ice except Jeremiah's. I didn't know 
another level existed until I got exposed to it. I thought what I had experienced with Rita's was the ultimate expression of pleasure when it came to that dessert. But just because I didn't know another level existed didn't mean another level wasn't possible. But once I got exposed to another level, I can never be unexposed to that level. So now the thing that I called great, I call good. It was great in one season because that was all I was exposed to. But once I got exposed to something different, and at least in my opinion, something that was better for me, what I called great in one season, I look back at and I call good now because I've been exposed to something different. Now watch this. My exposure wasn't informational. My exposure was experiential. See, I knew about Jeremiah's. I knew what Jeremiah's offered, but that was informational, not experiential. So when I transition (laughs) from informational knowledge to experiential knowledge, it exposed me to something, a degree and a dimension of satisfaction and pleasure that I didn't know was possible until I got exposed to it. Now you're wondering, what does Jeremiah's have to do with Jesus? I am telling you that it is possible to be living with informational knowledge. As a matter of fact, this is Jesus' primary critique of a group of religious leaders called the Pharisees. They had informational knowledge. If you said God is good, they would say all the time. If you say all the time, they would say God is good. If you say he's a doctor in a sick room, they would say he's a lawyer in a courtroom. If you say he's the lily, they're going to say of the valley, right? If you say he's a wheel, they're going to say in the middle of the wheel, right? They knew about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They knew about Daniel in the lion's den. They had informational knowledge. But they were lacking the experiential. So when God is attempting to groom and grow us into better and the best versions of ourselves, in part, what he does is he orchestrates a transition for you to experience your Jeremiah's. You loved the reader's version of your Christianity until you had a taste (laughs) of Jeremiah's. He, he, He orchestrates situations that transition us from informational to experiential. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Experiential learning is the most effective, but it is also the least comfortable. I'm going to say that one more time. Experiential knowledge is the most effective, but it is the least comfortable because it is easier to receive information than it is to walk through an experience. Because our text today reveals to us how God will orchestrate or use, rather, a situation to give you a revelation of him that you, that you could not get through information only. Are y'all feeling me? Put some fire in that chat. I said the text shows us how God 
will either orchestrate or in the case of this text, use a situation to give you a revelation of him that you couldn't get just through information. And, 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 and in the case of this text, the situation that he used to give a revelation of himself that you couldn't get through information was a situation called a storm. See, I don't know. I don't know what you've been calling your storms. Some of us have been calling them heartbreak. Some of us have been calling them heartache. Some of us have been calling them betrayal. Some of us have been calling them disappointment. Some of us have been calling them instability. Some of us have been calling them pain. I want to tell you, the text teaches there's another adjective you need to add to your array of words that you're using to describe storms. And this adjective is storms are school. Did you hear what I just said? I said storms are school. It means that God uses these turbulent seasons in our life where our atmosphere is disrupted and he uses it as an opportunity to educate us about him in ways that we could not be educated had it not been for that experience. See, here it is, family. We're in a series called Faith University. And this series is not intended just to teach us about faith. It's intended to build it. And what, what we've established is that your faith hinges upon your revelation of three things. God's character. God's, that's who he is. God's competence. That's what he can do. And then God's covenant. That's his pre-established agreements with you. So the strength of a person's faith is not going to be tied and tethered to how inspired a person is from the sermons taught about faith. It's short, it's inspirational, but it is not transformative because it's short-lived. But if faith is going to be built, it's going to be tied to a revelation of three things. Your revelation of God's character. Who is he? God's competence. What can he actually do? And then God three, God's covenant. What has he already agreed to do for me? Ooh, I can't wait till I get the covenant because most people are confused. They, I don't know what God's will is. It's because you don't understand covenant. I'm not saying you're going to know what God's will is in every situation. No, Do, but am I saying that we are more confused about it than we than we have to be? Absolutely. Because when you understand covenant, you understand what he's already agreed to. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Did you hear what I just said? Him supplying needs is a covenant promise. Did you hear what I said? He said, I already agree. <laughs> I made an agreement. I told you now what triggers the covenant. Seek me first. The, the, come on now. The, the covenant, it's been bequeathed to you. The, the writer of Hebrews says, why am I ahead of myself? The writer of Hebrews says that, that, that a testament, which is an agreement, a covenant, is not enforced until the death of the testator. Which means that I, if I have a will, what I bequeath to others is not released until I die. Jesus is the testator. So when he dies, it activates and triggers the will. And most people don't know his will because they haven't read the will. It's stuff sitting over in a trust for you. And you don't even know it. <laughs> Did you hear that? There's some stuff reserved for you when you hit a certain age. I'm going to see if you count that. <laughs> yeah, see, that's, are y'all hear what I'm saying? Yeah, my, my uncle, my uncle Steve, my uncle Steve, when he passed away, my uncle Steve, when he passed away, he had something set aside for his daughters in a trust that, they, that was not released until they got to a certain age. See, in the natural, it's released when you hit a natural age. 
but in the spiritual. <laughs> it's released when you hit a spiritual age, which is why the enemy wants to keep us immature because he knows there are certain things that you can't get from the trust until you become a certain age. But am I talking to anybody in here that says my faith is getting stirred already because I want everything God's got for me. I don't want anything in a wheel sitting in a trust that can be in my life. He says one thing to know that informationally it's another thing to know that experientially and the text says hey God uses or orchestrates unusual circumstances to give you a revelation of number one his character y'all I'm getting ahead of myself but I want you to see the dots and how they connect here do you not see at the end of the text the disciples said who is this what you mean who is this you left your business to work for him, work with him. What you mean, who is this? Yeah, this is Mark chapter 4. We're going to talk about this next week. Next week, in Mark chapter 1, Peter, he just healed your mother-in-law when she got sick. What you mean, who is this? You knew who he was. Informationally. <laughs> this was your reader's version. But God says, I need, to, <laughs> I need to use and orchestrate a circumstance. And I'm speaking. I want someone to hear this like it is a right now word for you. I want you to hear this like God is giving clarity regarding your calamity. And I want you to hear right now, you are not in a storm. You're in school. Because if you just see it as a storm, your focus will be getting out. But if you see it in school, your focus will be getting what God's trying to teach you. Somebody put in the chat, I'm trying to see something. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't need to get out of this until I see what God's trying to show me. Because if I don't see it, he's going to have to reteach me again. I'm not just trying to get out. I'm trying to see something. Because you could have stopped this and you didn't. So what do you want me to see? You could have blocked this and you didn't. So what did you want me to see? You could cause this to end quicker than it's ending. So what do you want me to see? They trying to get out. I'm trying to see something. I'm trying to see something. Because if I don't see because if I don't see what you're trying to teach me, you're gonna keep me repeating this great. I don't want to keep repeating this great. Because God, God, you don't give false promotions. You don't put me ahead if I hadn't demonstrated mastery on the level that I'm on. So all you're gonna do is use a new storm to reteach me an old lesson. So I just learned. I'm trying to see something. What you want me to see? What you want me to fix? Yeah. <laughs> yeah what, you, what, what you want me to? What you want me to address? Yeah. Uh, what, what do, I'm trying to see something. And, and this text is a powerful picture of what I'm attempting to articulate. Family, I love this. See, we, we picked up in verse 35, uh, and I want you to see this. All right. I want you to put this on the Lord. Third, Lord I want to put this on the screen, Lord. Third, so you can see this. The text says this. That day when evening came. Now look at me. That seems simple, but it's profound if you know what else happened that day. See, that day when evening came doesn't matter unless you know what happened that day. You want to know what happened that day? All that day, Jesus is mentoring, coaching, discipling, and teaching his students. When you look at Mark chapter 4, what you'll see is the entire chapter is a chapter of parables. So all he's doing is teaching. Okay. He's using a teaching tool called parables, okay. 
which is what I just did, right, people? It's, it's what I call the, the, the homiletic of Jesus. It is the, the, the teaching style of Jesus, teaching, taking something that is culturally popular, taking something that, people, that is natural, that people can understand, and using it to explain something that is spiritual that people could not understand. So he explained the kingdom of God, living the king's way by using parables. And in Mark chapter 4, all he does is tell parables. He spends the entire day teaching. The entire day teaching. They're getting information all day. Now remember, they did not have some of the accoutrements that we have in our current context. So when they got bored, they couldn't scroll. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not even going to bother that. Right? Yeah, I'm not even going to bother that because a lot of times people talk about how in our current culture context, we're so spiritually desensitized and we don't see some of the like exploits that we see in, in the book of Acts and just some of like the spiritual sensitivity and God doing unique things. And it's because we distract it. Yes. <laughs> Here it is. So all day he's teaching parables. He teaches the parable of the sower, the seed. Now, now this is what's so dope, y'all. Mark chapter 4, verse 1 says, He began to teach by the lake. So he's teaching on one side. <laughs> he's teaching on one side. They're not in the lake when he's teaching. He, he's teaching by the lake. And then the text says, after he gets through teaching by the lake, he tells the disciples, now let's get in it. He says, you got a phone full of notes? Let's get in it now. He, say, he, says, he, he says, you got a feed full of Facebook posts? Let's get in it now. <laughs> he says, let, let, let's get in it. Because you thought class was by the lake. <laughs> class is not by the lake. Class is in the lake. So he tells them, he says, all right, I love this. He says, let us, do you see this? Go over to the other side. Now watch, how, watch, watch the detail Mark gives us. Mark says, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along. <laughs> see, sometimes people go in the lake and the orders reverse. They leave Jesus and take the crowd. But the text says, <laughs> the text says they left the crowd and they took Jesus. Because it's easy to pick the crowd when you're not in the lake. When things are cool, calm, copacetic, it's easy to pick the crowd until you need somebody that can speak to storms. Until you need somebody who can say peace be still and the atmosphere obeys. Till you need somebody that can break a fever when Tylenol can't. Till you need somebody that can heal a broken heart. Until you need somebody that can wipe away every tear from your eyes. The text says, let us go to the other side and leaving the crowd behind. What does this mean? It means that some people... Watch this. That were in the crowd were not a part of the us. So Jesus said, let us go to the other side. And we would assume that us mean everybody. <laughs> but everybody in the crowd is not a part of us. And some of you are getting frustrated because you're trying to include people in on a word because they in the crowd. But the word is not for people that's in the crowd. The word is for people that's a part of the us. And in this season of your life, I believe God is trying to show you your us. He's trying to show you because we think everybody in the crowd is a part of the us.
God says, they're in the crowd, but they're not. They, they were for you by the lake. Y'all aren't talking to me. They're for you by the lake. They're not for you in the lake. Some people are good on the shore, but they're not good in the sea. I am telling you, and this sounds so, this is, this is why I think part of, not my only, but like this is why relational intelligence, the guys are just dealing with this, it's, it's just so important because it's everything. Your ability to move forward yes. is tied to your willingness to leave the uninterested behind. Some people love being by the lake. So they heard the same thing you heard. Let us go. But they didn't respond the way you responded. Because they're not into us. Because they like being by the lake. They like it. It's like you like it over here. Teach me all day. Give me parables all day. Give me information all day. That I have no intention on doing anything with. I've been talking to a lot of my friends, a few of my friends, like in the coaching space, and I'm just like, man, I'm kind of confused because it seems like the way at least we're doing church in the West, it just, I don't know if we're actually empowering people or enabling them. It's like it's, like it's almost like a culture of enablement. It's unintentional, but it's a culture of enablement. It's so weird. It's like, um, so we, 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 we've created a culture it seems to me in the West, most specifically America, a church where it's like we comfortable yeah. by the lake. Yeah. It's like I don't really want that much spiritually. I just need, I need, I need spiritual assistance when I'm dealing with the consequences of my own ambition. So let me make my own decisions. And as long as it worked, God, you stay out of that. When it doesn't work out, I need you to come back in and fix what I broke because I didn't listen to you in the first place. There's a difference between the crowd and the us. And some people, Jesus is on the boat moving. And you on the shore trying to convince the uninterested. Are y'all all right? I got a few months. Okay. <laughs> Here it is. So, so in my Bible. So the text, <laughs> so, so the, the, the text says they, <laughs> they, they took him along just as he was. Woo. They took him along just as he was. They took Jesus along just as as he was, as he was, uh-huh. not as they thought he should be, but as he was, because as he is, is enough. Oh my God. Yes. That is too good. Yes. Did you hear what I just said? So, because I, I, we're about to go somewhere. Uh-huh. I need to make sure you got the right Jesus in your boat. Right. Oh my God. Here it is. Watch what it says. It says. There were other boats with him. (laughs) So, watch this. A furious squall, a storm came up. And the waves broke over into the boat so that the boat was nearly swamped. Don't miss this. So a storm comes. And the storm influences the sea and the sea starts getting in the boat so a storm comes the storm influences and impacts the sea and the sea starts getting in the boat all right now I said the storm comes and the storm starts influencing the sea 
and the sea starts getting in the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Here's the issue. But Jesus was in the stern sleep. Okay. I kind of understand if you're sleeping through the thunder. I kind of understand if you're sleeping through the lightning. I kind of understand because it's not a yacht. I'm trying to understand how you sleeping through the rain. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is interesting now. Because I'm like, okay, it's raining. You don't feel that, Jesus? Don't miss this. He wet, but he still sleep. Then water starts filling the boat, and he still sleep. (laughs) So what happened? There's a storm going on on the outside that's causing things to flood on the inside. Because storms produce floods. And it starts spilling over into areas that you didn't expect to flood because of a storm. It's one storm, but then it starts flooding into the relationship. Did you hear what I just said? It's a storm that has nothing to do with the company. But then it starts flooding over into the business. It's a storm that has nothing to do with the children. But it starts flooding into the parenting. It's a storm that has nothing to do with you physically. But the emotional pressure is producing so much stress and strain on the body. It starts flooding into other areas of your life. Is there anybody that's ever been in a storm that caused a flood? Yes, Lord. Oh my God. Yes. You're saying this thing has nothing to do with this thing, but because of this thing, it's flooding over here. Yes. And Jesus is asleep, inactive, unengaged, unbothered. Knowing this is going on, but not doing anything about it. And so the text says this. It says the disciples woke him up. Y'all better come get me. Did you, whoo, <laughs> Lord have mercy. I should have saved this sermon for a live service. I'm telling you right there. I believe we would have had a runner right there. I said the disciples woke him up. They woke him up naturally. Which means we need to ask ourselves, what's the equivalent of waking him up spiritually? Ah, I want somebody in the chat to put holla until he hear you. Praise until he hear you. Pray until he hear you. Call him until he hear you. You better wake him up. You have not because you ask not. Wake him up. They woke him up. (laughs) They woke him up naturally. We have to wake him up spiritually. (laughs) Woo! They didn't. Now now I want you to see something. When they woke him up, this is what they asked. They said, "Teacher," because that's (laughs) y'all. Okay, te- te- teacher, because that's all I know you as. That, that's, 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 that's been my experience with you. I mean, in, in chapter four, you've just been teaching me all day. So you just, that's all I know. <laughs> teacher. Because that's all I know. <laughs> that's, uh, teacher. Because <laughs> some of us, that's all. Teacher is all we know. 
deliverer. That's all we know. Savior, one who secures my eternal existence in the unbroken, pres- unbroken with unbroken communion and fellowship with God. That's, that's what we know. But that's not all he is. And he say, if all I ever do is teach you by the lake, all you'll ever know about me is that I'm a teacher. If I don't (laughs) orchestrate or arrange or use different situations to force you to lean into a different side of me, you will live your whole spiritual life only knowing me as teacher. It was teacher for them. I don't know what it is for you. You fill in the blank. Just Savior. I'm done, Tario. They tired. I'm done. Here it is. Here it is. <laughs> Watch this. Teacher, I'm done. Don't you care? Don't you care if we drown? They didn't say, don't you care if we struck by lightning? They said, don't you care that we drown? Now, I don't know if they're talking about in the boat. Probably not. Maybe they're talking about in the sea. They're saying, don't you, don't you care? Because I would assume that if you care, you will be behaving differently. So because you're not doing in this circumstance what I think you should be doing, I'm going to question whether or not you care. Because you can't care and see me about to drown. But somebody put in the chat, but did you drown though? Yes. But did you? No, no, no. You didn't drown. Just because you are afraid doesn't mean you're in danger. Watch what Jesus says. This is so interesting. He woke up and said nothing to them. He got up. The text says he rebuked the wind. And then said to the waves, quiet or peace, be still. Then the wind died down and was completely calm. Now verse 40 says, Then he said to the disciples, he says, because I see you're so emotionally intoxicated with fear. I got to talk to the wind before I talk to you. This is this is why most of us don't get words about the storm until after it. This guy like I can talk to you now. Now, let's look back on that. (laughs) Because while we in it, we're trying to get the water out the boat. And he says this. He says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now, this seemed to me like an unrealistic question. It's, It's like, what do you mean? Why am I afraid? You see the water in the boat? That's why I'm afraid. But I think Jesus is asking them, why are you so afraid? (laughs) Do you still have no faith? Because he's trying to get them to see that what you're getting outside the sea is inadequate. Because part of the parable that I taught you earlier this day was a parable of the sower with the word. 
and how the word is sown like seed on different types of soil. That soil represents different types of hearts. And some of that, that, <laughs> that, um, that, that seed doesn't bring forth fruit because it's choked up by cares and worry. He's like, I just finished talking to you about this. Why are you so afraid? He says, I'm not saying it's as, as it is as if he say, I'm not saying, why are you so afraid? Because of the storm, because of the presence of the storm and because of the presence of the water on the boat. I'm asking, why are you afraid? Because, you know, I'm on here. So if it's just water, you should be afraid. If, yeah, yeah. So, so, so if, it, if it was just, <laughs> if it was just your circumstance, you should be afraid. If it was just your situation, you should be afraid. But Jesus is like, watch this. I'm on the boat. So it doesn't matter if the water's here. If I'm here, why are you afraid? Now watch this. Because when we left the shore, I said, let us go to the other side. It's even in the Greek, it's in the imperative. It's not a question. It's a command. He's saying we're going to the other side. Now, if I say we're going to the other side on the shore, what's causing you to question what I said when we get on the sea? If I said we're going to the other side, a storm in the middle of the sea is not going to stop us from getting there. I said we're going. And I'm trying to show you. I'm trying to show you character. I'm trying to show you that I am worthy of trust. I'm trustworthy. Why do you have no faith in me? In me. Because I'm here. Now, what did I tell you on the shore? Does the storm have you questioning that in the sea? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Yes, yeah. I mean, there are things God showed me, told me about our church on the shore. I don't see some of those things yet, but he told me on the shore. So storms that we may have run into in the sea do not cancel what the Savior said. On the shore. He's trustworthy. So my question to you is, what did he say on the shore? I'm done. And the text says they were terrified. And they asked each other, who is this? They thought they knew who he was. Because earlier they called him teacher. But after they saw it, after they saw, after they saw, I love this. I love their lack of certainty. They're like, I don't even know what you is yet. I just know you're more than what I thought you were. They say, who is this? One translation says, what manner of man is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. Say, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> but it was a situation that God was using to give a revelation. It takes the thorn. For you to get a revelation that he gives you strength to endure weakness. It takes this. It takes. Are y'all following me here? He, he uses. Now, I didn't even deal with my notes. It's three types of storms. It's self-storms, storms we create, satanic storms, storms orchestrated by the enemy. 
And then there's stuff storms, storms that are just a consequence of living in a broken and imperfect world. You see this with every miracle of Jesus. You see some of this, right? It's some jams people got themselves into. Then there are other issues you see where he performed a healing. He performed an exorcism first. That's sim- si- signifying that there's some satanic involvement with that issue. And then there are other times where he deals with people. He performs no exorcism. The disciples are like, who's sinned? This man or his parents that this man's born blind? He say, nobody. It's life. So sometimes storms hit those categories, right? And in this case, this was a satanic one. And you don't know it's a satanic one until you see what happens in Mark chapter 5 when they get to the other side. As soon as they get to the other side, they run into this man who's in a cemetery cutting himself. Satanically influenced to engage in self-destructive behavior. So they're bleeding, so they leak in what they need to keep. Some people leak in joy, yes. leak in peace, yes. leak in strength. Yes. They're leaking it. So the storm doesn't make sense until you get to chapter 5 and you see, oh, this is why the storm came in the middle of the sea. Because the enemy knew the impact we were going to make when we got to the other side. Jesus, I'm not even going to bother this. Jesus had, the, had that one man in mind on the shore. So we got to go over here. I'm on assignment. You and I going to the quote unquote next level isn't just about God getting you to the next level. It's about the people that are waiting on you to arrive there. So here's my question. It's a question for reflection. This is my action item. When I'm preaching, I'm thinking of two things. What do I want them to know? And then what do I want them to do? What I want them to know, what I want them to do, that's what I want you to do. I want you to reflect. I want you to ask yourself this question. Have I been trying to get out of my storms? Or have I been trying to see something? God wants to get you to my I want you to, I want you to see something. You're not going to drown. I'm on the boat. You're trying to get out because you think you're going to drown. You're not going to drown. I'm here. I need you to see something. Because this situation not only exposed God, Jesus, to the disciples, it exposed the disciples to themselves. Because if you were to ask them, if you were to ask them about their level of faith before the sea, they would have told you it's probably 10. But now when they get through the storm, They not only have a revelation of God, they got a revelation of themselves. Because sometimes God's trying to show you him, and then there are times God's trying to show you you. God, I'm I'm trying to see something. What are you trying to show me? So I want to pray a simple prayer over you that the prophet prayed over his servant when his servant was overwhelmed with anxiety. Elisha had to pray over his servant. His servant was overwhelmed with anxiety because enemy armies had come to take him and the prophet captive. And Elisha prayed this prayer. He said, Lord, open his eyes. He He didn't say, Lord, send help. Help was already there. He said, help him to see what exists that he's not exposed to. God's trying to show you something. So Father, I pray that the God who opens blind eyes naturally will open eyes spiritually. In the name of Jesus, I pray right now for everybody that is in a storm and I pray that you'd give them eyes to see what you're showing them about you or what you're showing them about themselves. We thank you that because you're on our boat, we will not drown. We declare, it's our confession, it's our affirmation in the middle of our storms. I'm trying to see something. Show me you and show me me. 
Lord, I ask you this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Clap your hands in this studio. Put some fire in that chat, everybody.